Welcome back to Book View Now, our coverage of the National Book Festival here in Washington, D.C. I'm Jeffrey Brown, and I'm joined now by Joyce Carol Oates. Nice to talk to you again. Thank you. We're going to talk about two books, fiction and nonfiction. The fiction is The Man Without a Shadow, Nonfiction Soul at the White Heat. Are all these books equal to you, the fiction and nonfiction? <laughs> well, it's a difficult <laughs> question to answer. Usually the, the nonfiction books have been accumulated over a period of time. I mean, the, the parts of the book, it probably is like 15 years. There's um, a visit interview with Doris Lessing mm -hmm. from, the, I think, the 1970s yeah. in the book. Whereas a novel is usually written a very finite period of time and a work of nonfiction is assembled over a longer period. Mm -hmm. So it's a little hard to, to gauge that. But, but as a, um, in the way you think about it or what you're doing in life, uh, do you have an equal love for both forms? <laughs> <laughs> when I look at some parts of Soul at the White Heat, some of the memoirist essays and a piece on Muhammad Ali or a piece on Mike Tyson, I really feel kind of engaged by what I'm, what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And it's a different sort of engagement. It's more intellectual. Whereas with the novel, it's more of an emotional, psychological immersion. It's like these are different relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the novel first. This is um, a story of a man who, a man and a woman, the man has lost his ability to remember things, yes. right? So tell, tell me a little how that came to you. I wanted to write a, um, a novel about a very intense relationship between a scientist who, ha who happens to be a woman and her subject, who is a man, and how their intense friendship, which becomes a, a romance, it becomes a kind of erotic relationship, but it's a very deeply emotional relationship, primarily. That is, she, she really loves him. He has strong feelings for her, but only in a very finite way because he keeps forgetting her. Mm -hmm. the, a brain-impaired person who has had damage to the hippocampus, a part of the brain that forms new memories, can't form any new memories. Right. So he has a, a memory span of about 70 seconds. He is literally forgetting everything within a, a, a minute or so. He forgets everything new, but he yeah. has a whole life until yeah. then. He was 37 years old when he was injured. Yeah. And so he has all that life in the past. He remembers everything from the past, but he can't form new memories. It's not so different from the memory impairment of people when they get older. Mm -hmm. Their short-term memory starts to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I told you that I had read uh, and interviewed the author of this new book called Patient HM, yes, yes. which looks at one of the most famous uh, subjects in, yes. the, in the history of neuroscience. You, were you pattern, patterning your character on people like that? Yes, HM is, is the most famous of all the amnesiac subjects in neuroscience, but there are others, and one of them is named Lanny Johnson. Mm -hmm. She lives in the Princeton area, and one of my husband's colleagues in neuroscience at Princeton is is working with her. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he's researching her memory loss, which is profound. She doesn't have long-term memory either, mm -hmm. no short-term or long-term. A very uh, devastating encephalitis that caused her brain to to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. C can I ask you to read the very beginning? Because oh, sure. it, it kind of shows the, uh, a sense, of, a sense yes. of what you're talking about. Just the, just the first section there. Notes on Amnesia, Project EH, 1965 to 1996. She meets him, she falls in love. He forgets her. She meets him, she falls in love. He forgets her. She meets him, she falls in love. He forgets her. At last she says goodbye to him 31 years after they first met. On his deathbed, he has forgotten her. She meets him, she falls in love, he forgets her. Yes. It's quite, it's extraordinary. Yes, it's very sad and yet I felt it was a positive experience for the young woman who had never met anyone like this man. She never had fallen in love before 
and her feeling for him is so genuine. Mm -hmm. And she, want, she would really like to take care of him and have him live in her house, and she would take care of him, but his, um, his family won't allow it. It becomes her story as much as his, of course, right? Yes, yes. I think we all fall in love with our, the products of our imaginations. I was thinking partly of a writer's relationship with her subject right. and how we do fall in love with the aesthetic object that we're trying to create. And so you're, you're, t you're aware of these real life case sto studies. Yes. What do you do? I mean, how much of it do you take, leave? How do you make those decisions? Well, one of the exciting things for me was doing research into neuroscience mm -hmm. and the science of memory because um, I think most people don't understand the, the degree to which scientists are extraordinarily imaginative in creating experiments. Mm -hmm. The experiments that deal with memory that I read about are really so ingenious. I, if you work on an experiment, you might take a year to create a really good experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in molecular biology, some of the experiments could take two years mm -hmm. just to set up the experiment. Mm -hmm. And of course, pe people may go on to win a Nobel Prize because they've done all this work. But I think the average person, or even perhaps the average uh, humanist, doesn't understand the degree to which scientists are artists and are very imaginative. But I mean, this interests you, right? This yes. mix of, because yes. obviously yes. it allows you as a, as a writer to think about memory, yes. who, who we are, right? What makes us, us? Yes, and, and when my woman scientist is with the subject, she likes, she likes him as a person, but she's thinking of these experiments she might yeah. think up to deal with. How does a, a memory impaired person think of the future? And it's interesting because these people don't want to think about the future. And I find that I myself don't want to think about the future. And if you don't want to think about the past, it's very difficult to think about the future. I'm curious because you, you also mentioned Mike Tyson. I know you write a lot about boxing, have yes. a great interest there. Yes. And of course, that's been one of the issues is head injuries, right? And the impairment to the brain. W were you interested, has that interested you as well? Well, you're thinking perhaps of Muhammad Ali. Yeah, well, no, of course. I don't mean Mike Tyson uh -huh. in particular, oh, okay. but I mean in boxing generally, yes, there have been yes. issues of head injuries. Oh, and Muhammad Ali, of course, the main. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if Mike Tyson is in that category. Mike Tyson, according to his own admission, has taken a lot of cocaine, uh -huh. a lot of drugs. So I would think that drugs are very injurious to the brain. Yeah. Drugs and then the boxing itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, to be knocked out for just one second is to have a concussion. Yeah. It's very difficult for the very difficult sport, if you want to call it a sport. So coming to the, uh, in our last few minutes, the uh, nonfiction book, the first essay is, Is the Uninspired Life Worth Living? Which is looking at the lives and work of many poets and writers. Yes. It, was it the question that grabbed you? I mean, what? what? Well, uh, Socrates speaks of the unexamined life. Mm -hmm. is, not, is the unexamined life worth living? Right. You know, in other words, we have to examine our lives. And here I was just taking that remark and applying it to inspiration and writing about what inspiration is and how different it is for different people mm -hmm. throughout literary history. Quite amazing stories of how people were inspired who went on to write great masterpieces like Moby Dick right. and Middlemarch. It's really quite extraordinary stories. Uh huh. Is, is that how um, essays often start for you, to just take a, s a question like that and then? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yes, I think so. I've written about the writing life from different perspectives. I had a long piece once, the, r the life of the writer and a life of the career. Yeah. The way of the, ri the writing life is one thing, but the career is a different. And that was, an inter that was something that interested me very mm -hmm. much also. Mm -hmm. Did, did you come up with an answer for yourself about whether the, un the, uh, the uninspired life is worth living? Well, the un uninspired life will not lead to any works of art. It right. could be worth living in its own way, right. but nothing is going to last or abide for long the way Moby Dick or Middlemarch mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. abide. In just our last minute here, as you're looking back at the lives of writers and artists, has your own sense of writing changed over the years? 
you're thinking about it, what it is, what you're trying to accomplish? Uh, I'm not sure that I'm trying to accomplish anything in a, in a large cosmic sense. It's more each story sort of demands to be told. Mm -hmm. At the Nava I'm working on now seems to be about something that to me seems very urgent. Mm -hmm. So I'm just coming to the very last 50 pages and I sort of focus on that. I'm not really thinking about something I did in 1979. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have that kind of overview of my own mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're a great reader as well, right? Yes, I, I love to read. Are you always reading while you're writing? I'm always reading yeah. and I'm usually reading for review. I tend right. to review for the New York Review of Books. Most of that book is, was published originally in the New York Review of Books. Uh -huh. So just are you, are you, because we're at a book festival here, are you sanguine about the state of book culture in this country? Or? Well, I am. I guess I've, I, I really am. I've heard that audio books are on the rise, and many people write to me and say that they really enjoyed hearing my books read, uh -huh. which I haven't had much experience with myself, but I look forward to it. All right, Joyce Carol Oates, thank you very much. Thank you.